Well, if you notice that I look a little bit more rested today, it's because I didn't have to drive over an hour to be with you this morning. <laughs> Sherry, the boys, and I are now residents of Smyrna and Rutherford County, and our Sunday morning commute went from a round trip of over 140 miles to eight. So <laughs> we are so excited. I got to sleep in until 7 a.m. this morning. <laughs> I still woke up at 6 and freaked out for just a minute that I had overslept and then remembered I was in a completely different house, rolled over and went right back to bed. It was wonderful, wonderful. So anytime you move, it becomes the perfect time for cleansing, doesn't it? It should at least. I'll admit Sherry is a lot better at this than I am. I'm not gonna say that I'm a pack rat, but I am overly sentimental when it comes to stuff. I can easily get attached to little things the rocks that Henry and Silas pick up and give me while we're outside on walks, odds and ends from places we have been, and numerous other things. I can't say this at the 11 o'clock sermon because Silas will be here, but in 2018, Silas was in preschool, and they had a little plastic cup, and they tie-dyed a coffee filter and taped it to the cup, and I would put keys and the rocks that they would give me from walks in there, and I threw it away last night, and my heart is broken. But... <laughs> It's a coffee filter that's tie-dyed. I think it's time to let it go. So I did. I did. I let it go. I'm still choking up a little bit over it, but it's okay. It's okay. I told you Sherry is better at this than I am. I also have a hard time letting go of things that are useful. Things that I have used only once, but might just maybe use again in the future. I have far more hand saws and axes and hatchets than I can ever use. I have a bad back. I really shouldn't be using any of them. But just as any self-respecting man should, I also have a coffee can with screws and assorted hardware in it that I made sure I actually packed it in bubble wrap when we moved. So, but it came in handy last night when we were hanging blinds in the house. So I cling to that thing so fast that I'll probably be buried with it. But we all have earthly things and just random stuff that we cling to. Many of us even find some sense of security in those things. I know I will probably never use the double bit ax that I pulled out of Sherry's dad's shop because it belonged to her grandfather, but I sleep better at night knowing that if I ever choose to take up logging in the Pacific Northwest, I'm set. <laughs> so even if you don't have stuff that you cling to, perhaps on the flip side, you cling equally as fast to the idea of being a minimalist. Where we find a false sense of control or freedom in having things, some find a false sense of control or freedom by not having clutter. And while that's probably the healthier of the two, it is still a false sense of security. Now, I don't know if you've ever been beside someone who is dying as they're drawing their last breaths. But as a minister, I can say that I count it as a privilege to be with a believer who is standing at the doorway to eternity. As John Piper puts it, I have the hope that someday I may get a glimpse through the door. I think that if I stand guard often enough, I might see something of what Paul saw when he said to depart and be with Christ is far better. I can't help but think that when a soul departs from the life of a saint, that Christ himself draws very near. Now as Christians, we should find our security not in earthly things, but in salvation and in the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And we should place our hope and our faith in the assurance of that heavenly salvation. I'll admit that I'm still on the new side of parish ministry, uh, four years in Clarksville and coming up on one here. But the last believer that I was with at the time of his death was a man named Bobby. This is in Clarksville. Now, Bobby had stuff. He had stuff. He had a shop behind his house that was filled with all sorts of things. When I pulled up to his house for the first time, I thought that his entire family had gathered around his deathbed, only to find out that it was him and one other person in the house, and all of those cars were his. Bobby had stuff. As I sat beside him in his living room while he was taking his last breaths, none of that mattered. None of that mattered. He didn't care about any of that. What he cared about was the assurance of his salvation. He wanted communion for the last time. He wanted confession for the last time. And he wanted to make sure that I knew 
that his family needed to know the hope that was about to become reality for Bobby. Seeing Jesus face to face. And that they had every opportunity to come to faith and to have eternal life as well. Because that is what matters most. Bobby wasn't concerned with the cars that were in the driveway. He wasn't concerned with the toys that were in the shop. Now this morning's epistle lesson from 1 John was fairly wordy, talking about the water and the blood and the spirit and the witness and the truth. Thankfully, I'm skipping over that and we're going to the last part. Now it can be easy to get turned around in the first half of that reading, but it all becomes abundantly clear when we get to the second half. Verses 11 through 15 say this, And this is the testimony, that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. And this is the answer to the fundamental question of our faith. What must I do to have eternal life? And not only do we have this question answered in this passage, but in verse 10, it tells us that this question is answered by the testimony of God himself. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. So now that we know the importance of having and how to have eternal life, what does it mean when John says to have the Son? I'm going to quote Piper again. So what does it mean to have the Son of God? The word have can communicate a lot of different nuances. For example, it doesn't mean quite the same thing each time you say, I have a dollar, or I have a cold, or I have an attorney. But there is something common to all these meanings. When you have something, it does its thing for you. If you have a dollar, it buys you a dollar's worth of stuff. If you have a cold, it makes your nose run. If you have an attorney, they stand in for you. Having something means that it does its thing for you. Now the testimony of God in verse 12 tells us that he who has the Son has life. So according to our line of thinking from above there, Having a son means the son does his thing for you. And what is the thing that Jesus did? Let's make a list. You know that I like lists. He came to earth to be fully man while remaining fully God. He came to earth to know what it is to be human, to be tempted, while remaining sinless. He knows the temptation of sin, the same sins that you and I face. He came to heal. He came to make new. He came to love. He came to bear our sins upon the cross. He came to conquer sin and death. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he will return again. Now, I told you I like this. We're going to do another one. Let's add some words to that very same list and say it again. He came to earth to be fully man while remaining fully God for you. He came to earth to know what it is to be human, to be tempted while remaining sinless, he knows the temptation of sin, the same sins we face, for you. He came to heal you. He came to make you new. He came to love you. He came to bear your sins upon the cross. He came to conquer sin and death for you. He rose from the dead so that you may have life. And he ascended into heaven to prepare a place for you. And he will return again to bring you home. That is what it means to have the Son. And if that doesn't give you hope, then all of those things that we just listed have either been done for you, or are being done for you, or will be done for you. They're being done so that you may have life, and that you may have, a, have it abundantly through the Son. Now this world and all of its struggles and pain and loneliness will not only cease, but those struggles and those pains and that loneliness will be defeated. In Christ, you have the assurance that this hope of eternal life is not only for you, but if, if you accept this gift, it can never be taken away. And that is the assurance that we have. This is from Paul. 
Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I really had to fight the urge of my Baptist upbringing to bang this 100-year-old <laughs> pulpit up here. But that's one that makes you want to slam your hand around. There's one question we still haven't answered, though. We know the importance of having eternal life. We know that we have eternal life through the Son. We know how to have it. We know the importance of having it. But how do we live knowing that we have the Son? How do we make that practical? Well, you may be thinking that I've already answered that question by beating around the bush in the first part of the sermon, but I want to be absolutely sure that it is abundantly clear how to have the Son of God. Because verse 12 tells us, Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. But thankfully, the answer to that is just one verse away. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, to have eternal life, you must have the Son. And the way to have the Son, and the only way to have the Son, is to believe the Son. And to live in the assurance that this hope of salvation, which we as believers cling to by faith, will one day be realized when we step from this life into eternity. And if you have made the decision to follow Jesus in faith, then I encourage you to live a life that honors Him as the Son of God. Again, your life will have its ups and downs and its trials and tribulations, but we can find rest in the assurance that we are His and He is ours. We are in Him and He is in us. If you've not made the decision to believe the Son, please see me or anyone here. All of those things that we listed above have already been done for you. God is waiting for you to believe in His promise, to accept His offer of eternal life. This is not an offer that you can buy, or one that you can earn, or one that you can find a way around at the last day. This offer is free, and it is for you. And today is a day to accept this offer, because not a single one of us in here is guaranteed tomorrow. Now, as I sat with Bobby again, he wasn't concerned with this stuff. He wasn't concerned that it was raining and those cars were getting wet. He wasn't concerned that his lawnmower, which cost more than my car, was setting out in the rain. He wasn't concerned about all the stuff that was on the shelves cluttering his home. When I sat there with Bobby, he wanted us to say together the words of a hymn, which if you're raised in the Episcopal Church, you may not know, but it's called Blessed Assurance. It's not, for some odd reason, in the 1940 hymnal or the 1982 hymnal, but Bobby wanted us to say that together. So I'm going to close with the words of that. I'm, not, I'm going to spare you. I'm not going to sing it to you. But this is blessed assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Perfect communion, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.